Hello, uh, I'm Ashley Purpura, and I'm an Associate Professor of Religion at Purdue University and the co-editor of Orthodox Christianity and Contemporary Thought book series with Fordham University Press. I'd like to welcome you to this installment of Women Scholars of Orthodox Christianity, which is one of the many initiatives of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University. The Fordham Center facilitates, funds, and publishes scholarship on the Orthodox Christian world broadly understood. To learn more about the center, its initiatives, or publications, please visit the website at www.fordham.edu slash orthodoxy. We would also encourage you to follow the center on YouTube, click like on our programming, and to share this and other videos with anyone who might benefit from it. I'm joined today by our guest scholar, Dr. Mary Farag, who is an assistant professor of early Christian studies at Princeton Theological Seminary, and is a historian of Christianity and late antiquity. We are here to feature her and her 2021 book, What Makes a Church Sacred? Legal and Ritual Perspectives from Late Antiquity, that was recently published in both a paperback edition and an open access downloadable book, so no one has any excuse not to read it. Uh, in general, Dr. Farag's research focuses on Christian liturgical practices in late antiquity, and their role in the wider Greco-Roman, Byzantine, and Islamic worlds. Her geographic specialty of Egypt often leads her abroad to study Coptic and Arabic manuscripts and participate in archeological projects. Mary is active in educational work in Coptic Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox parishes. Welcome. Our format today is similar to that of other episodes. I'll start us off with some questions for a discussion for 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to Q&A. So those of you joining us, please feel free to put any questions you have in the Q&A by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen. And as always, we have disabled the chat, so all questions should be in the Q&A, and we'll get to as many as we can before the end of our time together. All right, Mary, could you start us off by telling us a little bit more about yourself and what has shaped you as a scholar and then introduce our audience to your book briefly. I know that's a lot in that first question, but you know, tell us about you and uh, your book. First of all, thank you so much for having me in this series. It's a pleasure and an honor. Um, so I was um, raised in a Coptic Orthodox community and that upbringing, I think, shaped a lot of my scholarship, and I'm sort of retrospectively learning more and more about that. Um, but, you know, so growing up in, in that community, um, we would be praying in English, in Egyptian Arabic, in Coptic, and in Greek. Um, and so I think there's something about that multilingual experience that, um, grew in me a fascination with languages um, and eventually led me to study linguistics as an undergraduate, um, which, you know, and learning languages is not, is not easy, um, but there's just a love for that that I think um, was instilled in me from a very young age. Um, and then in addition to that, um, my father loves patristics. Um, so I grew up even in elementary school. <laughs> learning patristics. <laughs> this is like a hagiographical narrative, right? Like at recess, you're telling your friends about what, you know, the Holy Fathers have said about something. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Um, and, and well, and teachers in a middle school and high school, um, sometimes not knowing what to do with that. Um, but, you know, it was there, there was something also very formative about that. Um, and I think uh, one, one thing that sort of really led me in that direction was as an undergraduate studying linguistics, um, a, a Father John Baer was invited to teach patristics at Harvard Divinity School. And so I audited that. It was a great opportunity. Um, and I think there's, and I audited other classes too there um, that led me eventually to study liturgical studies um, with uh, Teresa Berger and Brian Spinks, um, and then eventually led to working on um, a doctoral dissertation. And um, I hesitate even to begin naming uh, names because there's so many people who have journeyed with me and who've taught me so much. Um, and I fear, you know, missing some really important names. Um, but, you know, Bentley Layton and Stephen Davis taught me Coptic. Um, I spent a year in Germany where Stephen Emmel um, devoted a lot of time to helping me also 
um, solidify my Coptic. Um, and uh, for learning Roman law and getting introduced to that, um, John Matthews, his help was indispensable and Nolensky. Um, and again, the list goes on and on. Um, and I sometimes the acknowledgments, I right, of your, of your book. You have a very nice acknowledgment section, so we can, <laughs> we can turn there for even more. But it, I mean, it sounds to me like this, this lineage, right, that you've, you've trained with and, and being exposed to all these different linguistic cultures, even as a child in your upbringing, and then going into that formal study uh, really has um, shaped you as a scholar. Uh, and kind of the, not only the sources you have access to, but kind of your, your approach to, to looking at text, but also the material world around those texts too. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And I um, learned from a, a lot of art historians too, how to navigate that, um, especially uh, Vasilis Marinis and Felicia, uh, Felicity Harley McGowan. Um, they helped me a lot. And it's, it's really their dedication and love and support um, that carried me through. You know, I really couldn't have um, done any of this without their believing in me um, and helping me gain the, the skills and knowledge that I needed. Um, and turning now to the book, um, I think the best way to begin talking about it is actually um, to talk about the, the cover image. Um, I'm so thankful that um, it has this cover because this, especially this juxtaposition here between this magnificent church um, and a model of it, right alongside the psalm verse um, that actually says, he has given freely, he has distributed to the poor. Um, there's a real tension here between those two things. Um, and that's exactly the tension that I'm trying to bring into high relief in this book. Um, how is it that these two things can sit together, this highly, highly ornate, monumental, magnificent church, and yet this um, abundant giving to the poor? Mm -hmm. um, so that's really what the, the book kind of sits right in the middle there <laughs> between these two, <laughs> um, and that's what it's all about. That was one thing that struck me when I was reading. You kept you mentioned a couple places that the primary duty of the bishop is the care of the poor, and I thought, is that 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 I definitely should be the case, right? But when we think about all the duties of a hierarch, is that necessarily the first thing that comes to mind? And so that was an interesting kind of juxtaposition of the care of the church means then also the care of the poor, right? So that was kind of oh, that's exactly right. That's exactly I think that's right. something that we miss in these beautiful ornate building projects that are often the the, the domain of the priests or the um, the hierarchs, right? Yes, absolutely. And so part of this is trying to engage that question. Well, why is it that they're building these monumental ornate churches, and that in their view that fits with their primary responsibility to care for the poor? So your book includes, uh, for those who haven't read it, and I encourage you all to, right, has analysis of art, homilies, hymns, legal and ecclesiastical documents, hagiography, uh, canons, liturgical lectionaries, and then multiple um, sacred things, right? Um, and you draw then on Coptic, Syriac, Greek, Latin, Arabic, Armenian sources, context, am I missing other languages that <laughs> you're, you're engaging? Was there Georgian? I don't know. <laughs> um, and this is primarily within the first six centuries or so of Christianity. Uh, and then you include four appendices of primary sources and chronological lists of some of these sources. So, um, You've told us a little bit about your formation as a scholar uh, and what led you to be interested in these types of sources, but how did you come to write this book about these sacred things uh, and how they're navigated? Uh, and then maybe share with us a little bit about your method for approaching uh, this topic. Absolutely. Um, so one experience um, that led me toward this book topic um, was visiting the White Monastery Church in Soheg, Egypt. And it was, I, I had seen ancient churches in Egypt before, um, but this church really stood out to me because of its monumental scale. It is a very, very imposing structure. 
I actually spent much of that season in the shadow of the wall, <laughs> uh, you know, the outer wall, um, documenting a site just outside um, the walls. But I mean, that's how imposing it was. Um, and there's something about that experience going into the church and actually feeling the agency of the church um, in my experience there. You know, and um, not to say that um, the church is an animate being, you know, um, like other animate beings or anything like that. Uh, but there is um, an agency to the place uh, that definitely, you know, you can feel the working of it on you as you navigate the place um, and sort of have to have to respond to it. Um, so there was something about that experience, I think, that was very um, always in the back of my mind in reading this book um, and wondering, you know, these Christians of late antiquity, and also non-Christians too, who would engage with this space, what was their experience of it? Um, you know, and both sides of the question, you know, so what were they told um, their experience of it should be? Um, right. What was um, their experience? And that there's a lot about what they were told. <laughs> um, so that's really where the book lies in trying to understand these um, sort of more prescriptive ways of understanding the church. Um, which I think are so important. Um, so that's a little bit about what led me to the topic. In terms of method, um, well, learning Roman law was is was you know um, a fundamental basis uh, for this book. And so when I found out that in the textbooks that were used in in late antiquity, you know any anyone who wanted to begin learn becoming learning how to become a lawyer or something like that um, or a jurist they'd start out with these textbooks and right there um, in these textbooks there's a category of sacred thing um, and that the definition of what a sacred thing is includes the consecratory ritual um, it's you know that's actually what makes something that was just a thing um, into a sacred thing, um, which was also somewhat familiar to me because um, the church that I was raised in actually was consecrated and that was the only ritual of consecration I had actually ever experienced. So I think that was also in the back of my mind too, this um, event, uh, major event for um, coming together uh, to celebrate this church. Um, so in terms of method, you know, that was really the starting point, that definition that shaped the entire book. So for the first half, it's thinking about, um, okay, so Roman law has this definition of what a sacred thing is. What does that mean for churches when they become, when they enter the legal sphere, you know, with Christianity being tolerated under Constantine um, and then up through Justinian, uh, how exactly does this definition get applied to churches? Um, and look, seeing that there is some tension, you know, this definition when it was made uh, wasn't made with a view toward Christian holy places. Um, and so what are the tensions that get drawn out as this definition is applied and then kind of has to expand um, due to its new application to these um, holy places? And then, you know, because the definition pinpoints the consecratory ritual as, you know, the critical event that changes something from a thing to a sacred thing, then wondering, okay, um, what do we see when we find, when we learn about these consecratory rituals? Um, do they reproduce what we see from the legal and canonical sources, or do we see something different? Um, and the answer was both and, which was extremely fascinating. Um, so that's the reasoning behind these two parts. Um, methodologically, there are lots of different methods that I drew upon. Um, so from the most basic method of just of compiling charts, um, giant charts of canons and laws and fiddling with them to sort them in different ways and um, try to analyze the sources uh, in different ways. That was one basic method, but I also drew from 
um, theories that I was studying. So um, critical space theory was really helpful in, in terms of reading folks who had already been, um, you know, not thinking about late antiquity, but thinking through this question of um, the agency of a place and mm -hmm. what that does for people who interact um, with a place. And um, then also social anthropology turned out to be really helpful for giving me a vocabulary for talking about the tension that I was noticing between um, the legal and ritual discourses, uh, but I was struggling to articulate that. Um, and so one big aha moment was reading um, a chapter by Igor Kapitov, um, where he talks about these terms, um, singularization and commoditization um, and thinking, thank you. <laughs> That's what I was looking some, for. Some economic type language to deal with, deal with the different ways in which that sacred space or those sacred things are used and that, that transference, right? That type of relationship between kind of who's the gift, who's giving the thing, who is receiving the thing, um, or the sacredness, I guess the blessing, right? The benefit, there's an exchange happening that you point to so beautifully um with a, a whole bunch of imagery in your in your book uh so it's it's helpful to hear that those types of theories uh one thing i found i really noticed was that was woven in so so compellingly right that it it really did you know help clarify it wasn't just kind of theory for the sake of theory which we've all read books like that um but this really you know it really helped us see a different a nuance that otherwise we, i think we would miss um so I felt that was very uh, helpful. And it's interesting to hear kind of how you came to that. Um, you, you also talk about this earlier when you're commenting on this, um, that people interacted. We know what people were told about sacred things or sacred spaces, uh, and maybe less about how they actually navigated that tension. But you do provide us some examples in the book of maybe the tension between kind of what happens when a sacred place, a church, for instance, uh, has to become a, a site of refuge or sanctuary, or what happens when something falls into disuse and maybe needs to be, um, you know, uh, I forget the term you use, alienated or something, right? So desacralized, unchurched, is that even possible? But then, you know, there's these kind of concrete ways that people have dealt with what do you do with this space that's no longer being used the way we thought it was? Um, do you want to give us maybe an example of that, those kind of tensions between kind of what people are told, how they should use that space, and then what you know from the legal uh, or even kind of some of the hagiographical material, of maybe not what people actually did, but other ways that they also interpreted that kind of sacred space? Yes, absolutely. And I, the most evidence we have is actually about the administrators of these places um, at the highest level, the bishops, um, how their actual experience, um, at least as we can learn them through um, their trials and writings that either they wrote or are about them, um, you know, unless we actually can interview them, it's hard to really get to the, what they actually experienced, but you know, at least that far. Um, and that's, that's where um, in this book, that's the majority of the, of, of, of how I sort of brought the, um, the thought world into kind of reality. Um, so yeah, the, I think the first example I should give um, is the story of uh, St. Laurentius, Lawrence. Um, because just his presence alone um, says a lot for this image. Um, so he actually is a saint from before Christianity uh, was tolerated um, and before churches became these, um, entered into the legal sphere. But his story becomes so important for exactly this tension that we do witness uh, post-Constantine. We, we have lots of different um, sources for his story, but uh, the one that I really highlighted in this book is a poem written by Prudentius, 
about the story, which is um, very dramatic. So the story goes that uh, Laurentius in the context of persecution in the mid third century, uh, he in Rome, he is told by the city prefect in Rome to produce all of the church assets because uh, in the persecution, the assets were being confiscated and Laurentius was the steward. So he was the administrator responsible for, you know, always keeping track, uh, inventory and so on. And um, so Laurentius says, okay, give me three days and I'll produce um, an inventory and, and produce all the assets. Um, now, technically what the prefect asks him to do is to hand over the treasures of the church. Hmm. And so this gives Laurentius an idea. Um, the true treasure of the church isn't these assets, it's the poor, it's the widows. And so he comes up with this very clever idea um, to gather up the poor and the widows and to bring them into the church. Um, and, and, you know, produce them as the treasure of the church. Um, and you have to understand the, the city prefect, he is a big authority in the city of Rome. And so this is the person you want to go to if you have a petition or a complaint um, about how the city is running. And surely these people he gathered into the church had plenty to say. <laughs> um, and so, after three days elapse, um, he brings the prefect and says, I've got everything for you. And then there's this very dramatic moment where the doors swing open and the prefect experiences the loud din. This is what Prudentius says, the loud din of all these voices coming at him. And I interpret that as um, they're petitioning him with- They're saying, the give, us, <laughs> give us more things, right? Give us what we need to live. <laughs> Exactly. Um, and it's amazing what the prefect declares at that moment. He says, we are being deceived by so many allegories, right? This allegory that the, tre the true treasure is uh, the people, not the things. Right. Um, and that's exactly, you know, his, that uh, utterance he has um, says so much when we think about all the cases where we have uh, bishops repurposing sacred things to practice mercy, mm -hmm. um, that's exactly um, the perspective, one perspective that we get on the issue. So if we kind of think about two different um, sides to this, and maybe, it's, so a helpful metaphor that I, I found for kind of describing the tension is that it's, it's kind of like two tectonic, tectonic plates. Mm -hmm. If you think of the legal discourse and the ritual discourse, you know, they kind of fit like a puzzle piece, but, you know, when they collide at that boundary, you, you get that shaking, that, that earthquake, which can be a minor tremor, but, um, you know, when it really collides, it can be catastrophic. Um, and that's really what I see in these cases, um, you know, with Ambrose of Milan, for example, you could call that kind of a minor tremor because he didn't um, suffer the consequences for what he did. But I would say for someone like John Chrysostom, that was kind of catastrophic uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but yeah, if you think about what the prefect said, we are being deceived by so many allegories. Um, you can hear in that what donors um, would have thought about this repurposing of, their, of what they had given so lovingly and for the salvation of their souls and in order to build this tight-knit relationship with the heavenly realm. Um, and so in, in the legal sphere, that's exactly the idea. You know, um, these sacred things are supposed to be protected um, and they are given once and for all in perpetuity, they are sacred, forever, nothing can interfere with that sacred status. Um, and literally, if there is an earthquake, even a natural disaster or anything does not change the status of the place. Um, 
And so when you think of, um, let's take Ambrose of Milan, for example, where uh, he's accused of melting down a chalice to raise um, funds to ransom captives. And so he has to defend himself. And he actually brings up the story of St. Laurentius as um, part of his defense saying, you know, actually those captives that were ransomed, they're the true church. They're the ones that this chalice is for. Um, and so when I alienate this chalice, far from desacralizing it, um, I'm actually increasing its it's true purpose, purpose, right? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. It's true purpose. And that's his defense speech. But um, his, that story is quite complex because we can kind of get hints that probably there was a political issue here where this chalice was um, donated by a predecessor that Ambrose was attacking as Arian. Um, and so... <laughs> He also maybe didn't want this chalice to begin with. <laughs> this could be participating in some memory erasure. Um, you know, so these, all these, every um, instance of repurposing a sacred thing, um, it could have these, these pure, you know, and, and um, ideal motives. Uh, but at the same time, they're so entangled in lots of different social relationships that they could easily be, interpreted in other ways as actually having some, um, you know, not so sincere motives behind them as well. Um, so they, they, they're always entangled in these ways. And that's what I found so fascinating that um, no matter, uh, and, and, and so if we, you know, I've talked a lot about the, the one side from the other side, you know, um, the folks who had to defend themselves for repurposing sacred things, um, in their view, this is the ultimate purpose of sacred things. And so they're focusing on the practice of mercy and that's their stand. But from the other side, they're thinking, well, why did it have to be this, this chalice? <laughs> why right. couldn't you have used something else? Something you know, somebody so, else donated. <laughs> exactly. Um, so right. Ibis of Edessa, that was one charge against him that he had funds that he could have used to ransom captives, but he chose to melt certain chalices for this purpose. Um, and that was the issue. There, there were funds elsewhere that he could have used. Why the chalices? Right. Well, that, that brings me to this. Maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on this idea of gift giving or re-gifting that you talk about uh, kind of in the middle uh, of your book. Um, I mean, you've talked, you talk about consecration and dedication and kind of why people give to the church or how they dedicate things uh, and the multiple ways that a place or a sacred thing itself might then relate both to the, the Christian community, uh, kind of to their spiritual life, but then also to God. And I think, you know, as you said, that this cover image is a great example and you have several uh, images of people donating or giving or dedicating a church uh, to Christ or to a saint. And then, but you have also this diagram of reciprocity, right? Of kind of the blessing then coming back. Um, so tell us a little bit more about how these late antique Christians negotiated and understood this type of dynamic about this kind of giving and then maybe what they're receiving, kind of what's what's the benefit there, especially if some bishop might melt it down and give it, give it away to, to help the poor or something like that. Um, tell us a little bit more about that. Oh, sure. Um, so if we, so this is just one small part of a much larger mosaic. And if we could see the whole thing, we would see um, Christ enthroned. And then on the other side, another um, a, a symmetrical image. Um, but in that case with a martyr um, and a crown. Um, and what I find, what I found really interesting in looking at not just this image, but images a lot like it in other churches, um, there's one church in particular in um, Porich, so just across um, the water from Ravenna, um, and it's the Euphrasian Basilica there, which was kind of like the key for helping me understand these symmetrical images, because um, at that church, 
you have in the Eastern apps a very similar image. Um, and Euphrasius, the bishop, uh, holding a model of a church, just like we say um, Pelagius holding um, this church here. But then we have also, um, so that's east, and then in and the north and the south, um, there are also images there. And it's very interesting because, um, and I, uh, yeah, so um, I hope I'm getting this right, but I, I believe in the north, we have um, crowns being like held over the heads of saints. Um, and then on the other side, on the south side, the crowns are actually sitting on their heads. And so that led me to think, then there's probably kind of a procession going on here, where when you're moving from the north headed east, um, you're in the process of receiving something from Christ. And then when you get to the other side, um, you've received it. Um, and so that then led me to wonder, is, it, is this image so straightforward that it's Pelagius holding this model of a church and giving it to Christ? Or is, there, um, is he receiving this actually from Christ? And I think the answer is both. Um, because there is um, a dynamic that takes place with the construction of a church when we read the sources. Uh, because at the consecration, the bishop will be thanking God and um, the patron saint and the heavenly hosts for the favor to build the church. So there's a, this acknowledgement that the bishop would not have succeeded in finishing the project were it not for a lot of celestial help. Um, <laughs> and so there's that thanksgiving for that help. Um, there's the giving over of the church, um, dedicating it to the patron saint and to God, um, but then also receiving it back really um, as a, in the form of a trust that now the bishop is entrusted to use this place for the people um, that God cares so deeply for. Um, and so in trying to understand these very complicated um, gift exchange, I was reading a lot about theories of how gift giving works in various cultures that use gift giving in, in radically different ways. Um, and what really helped me a lot was learning about cultures where gift giving isn't simply reciprocal. I mean, there are there is that reciprocal part of it, but the big picture is that you're always moving from A to B, person A to B to C to D, and so on. It's um, you, you're building a chain, really, um, and there is a reciprocal exchange between A and B. But if you zoom out from that and look at the bigger picture, it's in order to enable a chain that gets built. Um, and we, we have like a tiny idea of this in our culture with that phrase paying forward. Right. Um, like when we feel that someone's done something for us that we can't give back to them, um, we pay it forward in helping the next generation um, and so on. But so that same idea, except in this concept of um, what the church is for. Uh, so, you know, if I were to sort of map it out, you know, you've got God. Um, enabling the bishop uh, to build this church and the bishop builds it, which is kind of giving back to God, but then the bishop has to use that church for others. Um, and then others who receive benefit from the church also have to benefit others. And so you end up building this tight change, uh, tight chain that's always bringing more and more people into the chain. And the more people get drawn in, the tighter all the previous bonds get, um, which I found absolutely fascinating. Um, it, it is a little foreign because, you know, in our society, um, our, our economics are not built on that kind of structure. So it's hard to understand, but, when, um, but in reading about other cultures, it really helped me understand um, nuances from the text that I otherwise didn't have words for or even experiences to relate 
to them. Sure. Yeah. This, the, the type of kind of, not that the blessing increases, but we can understand kind of here's how people give something to the church. And yet that's both the building and the people, right? So one thing that you, one thing that's raised in your book is, is the church a who or what? Like, what is the sacred thing? Is it a person or, and I think you've shown that it, it is both, right? And there, there's a, a relationship uh, taking place there too, that um, even where we focus maybe very spiritually on the church as the people, it's not completely, when you think of that place having agency, right? It's not completely divorced from the, the physical building, right? That was built maybe with love or devotion or in this kind of, because that person loved God or wanted to help the church or, you know, there are all sorts of more kind of practical, perhaps less spiritualized reasons why people donate or give to the church or build aspects of the church. Um, but there is that relationship, um, I think, that you've, you've explained for us. So the last chapter before the conclusion uh, in your book focuses on anniversary celebrations, um, but also particular ways sacred things were negotiated in the aftermath of Chalcedon. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about what, what's unique in that context? What are some distinctions that emerge when we think about kind of church and sacred spaces and sacred things? Yes, um, thank you so much for this question. Well, um, as a result of the divisions post-Chalcedon, um, eventually, you know, and it takes many decades for this to happen, but eventually the rift um, becomes so deep that we end up with uh, parallel hierarchies. Um, and I'll focus on Egypt because that chapter focuses on, it is about Egypt. Um, so you end up with a hierarchy that is endorsed by the government. Um, and we have to understand that the, the, in the world of late antiquity, um, the state had to be involved because uh, sacred things were recognized by the state as these very special uh, divinely protected places and had state support, um, governmental support for ensuring that. Um, and the reason why the state needs to know who is the Orthodox Bishop and to um, kind of ratify that, you know, um, is so that the state knows who the proper administrators of these sacred things are. Um, and so the issue when, when we have, um, you know, and hence actually these words that uh, become legal words, you know, Orthodox, heretic, um, the reason why you have folks designated as heretics is so that the state knows, you know, they can't administer these places. Um, only what is imperially recognized as um, orthodox, they're the ones who can. Um, and so as a result of the rifts um, post-Chalcedon, you know, you have one hierarchy that is recognized um, and granted, you know, um, the administration of these monumental, magnificent churches. But then another hierarchy that's claiming that it is the, the, the orthodox hierarchy um, and actively working to um, get recognized as such. Um, and yet, you know, due to that lack of recognition from the government, that means they can't administer those places. And where this really hits home for folks in late antiquity is with the holy places um, in Palestine, especially Jerusalem, because by the fifth century and sixth century, those uh, places were very dear to the hearts of um, Christians. And um, it was considered real, really a privilege to be able to travel there and experience those places where um, Jesus and the apostles uh, and all the scriptural figures um, walked and, and, you know, all these uh, historical stories that we, that are cherished, um, you know, being able to be at those sites. So um, when non-Chalcedonians are not allowed um, to administer those sites, it becomes a real sticking point um, to the extent that, you know, the lead that leads 
non-Chalcedonian bishops to dissuade people from going to these Chalcedonian held churches. Um, but then if we come back to Egypt, um, the issue there becomes, well, um, what makes a non-Chalcedonian church sacred? Uh, because, you know, you have a bishop consecrating it, but it doesn't get that stamp of approval from the government um, or the whole support system for ensuring that this place is sacred. And so, um, you know, uh, I, I actually started this project reading those, these non-Chalcedonian stories about church consecrations and really not knowing what to do with them and constantly wondering uh, why, why would someone go through the intense effort to produce these texts? Um, because I Can you tell have... us a little bit for our audience, a little bit about some of those texts? I mean, some of the kind of apocrypha that you mentioned in these, you know, how these churches came to be built and justified. It's really interesting. Can you share with us a little bit, um, maybe one of those examples? Yeah, absolutely. So there's one attributed to Theophilus of Alexandria, the fourth century, uh, late fourth, early fifth century um, Archbishop of Alexandria. And um, it talks about how he goes south into Egypt to Koskom, and um, the monks invite him to stay for the feast of St. Mary. Um, and he says, okay, uh, but he doesn't quite understand the significance of the church. And so he prays for a revelation as to, you know, why, why this church has any significance. Um, and Mary herself appears to him and tells him the story of this church. And the story goes that when the Holy Family, you know, from Matthew chapter 2, uh, escaped to Egypt, they spent... Um, three and a half years walking through Egypt and getting so far south. And the longest uninterrupted stay they have is at this site, Koskom, for six months. And uh, the, the story makes a big um, to-do about how uh, Mary was actually very uncomfortable um, with this um, place at first because, um, or no, excuse me, um, forgive me, Joseph uh, was dissuading Mary from staying at this place because it was uninhabited, it had never been inhabited by a human being. Um, you know, you think of like as wild of a wilderness um, that no human has ever been to, this, this real emphasis on how it's never been touched. It's this pure, purest landscape you could possibly imagine. Um, and uh, but she insists and actually Jesus supports her um, and they stay there. And um, it's this time of respite that they finally enjoy. Um, I mean, there is one moment of turbulence, but uh, in their whole journey, it's just constant trouble upon trouble. And then it's this, this one time where they, um, where they, you know, kind of have a, a, a restful stay. Um, but the whole journey is hard on Mary, very, very hard on her. Um, and the, the story goes that before Jesus was ascending to heaven, he finds Mary crying, um, and in, inconsolable. And he tells her, why are you weeping? I've resurrected from the dead. <laughs> I've saved all of creation. Um, and then he says, well, um, if you are, um, crying because of our, our flight from place to place, you know, our exile, um, then this is my consolation to you. I'm, we're going to go right now, and I'm going to consecrate this place in your name as the first church, period, in the world. Um, and so, uh, and, and that's her consolation for um, this experience of exile, of um, flight from place to place. And I realized. Um, well, first of all, why, why does this um, text go through such great lengths to say this place is more sacred <laughs> mm -hmm. than you could possibly imagine? Any other right? church, anything else. Jesus himself made 
consecrated this space for this church, right? <laughs> Before he even ascended to heaven, mm -hmm. um, you know, so you can't, you can't get more sacred than that. And so, exactly. you know, wh why would someone make this point about, and it comes through a direct revelation of Mary to Theophilus, um, you know, so why this intensity um, and this, you know, extremely strong uh, language and, and ideas and I realized, um, well, you know, if the imperial government doesn't support the church as a sacred place, where does that support comes from? Come from? And so, you know, what these stories do is they say we don't need the imperial government's approval because Christ, the King, you know, if you think of the the emperor as a king of right. an empire, well, we don't need that king because the king that's actually higher than that king <laughs> is the one who made this place sacred. And I see this again and again in um, these anniversary stories that, um, and they're they're told this way, where um, Theophilus he's giving a homily on the anniversary of Coscom's consecration, and he he himself tells this story of how it was personally revealed to him by Mary that um, this church was consecrated by Christ Himself. Um, so that's one uh, aspect to this, and then. The other aspect is, um, I think through these stories, we get a glimpse of non-Chalcedonian experience, um, especially the exile of non-Chalcedonians outside of Palestine, um, and a lot of non-Chalcedonians from Palestine coming into Egypt and taking refuge there, either forcibly or voluntarily, um, and sort of talking about that experience and the painfulness of it by imagining Mary's pain in her own exile um, from that very same land into Egypt. Wow, that's, that's such a powerful image to think of, you know, I think, and a kind of present day American discourse, there's a lot about, you know, Mary and the Holy Family as being kind of a refugee, right? Um, and what is the church's response to that? But even seeing that in late antiquity, of uh, Mary being exiled, right, and and having to endure these trials, uh, it's very relatable uh, and has a lot of has a lot of power to carry uh, with it as an image. So um, I'm going to turn to one more question, uh, but I encourage our participants, those joining with us, uh, if you have questions, go go ahead and put those in the Q and A for us, uh, since we only have about 13 or so minutes left here. Um, so you do a lot of really great historical work in this book. Um, and But maybe I could ask you to think now as both a scholar and practitioner for a moment um, about Christian churches and communities today. Do you see parallels, similarities, um, distinctions uh, with their treatment of sacred things uh, compared to what you've studied uh, historically? Well, absolutely. So um, still today, there are Christian communities and liturgical traditions that um, put a lot of weight into the ritual of consecration um, and celebrating that moment as um, the moment when, you know, we've, we've given this church to God. Um, and by virtue of that, we have this strong responsibility to maintain this place as a church. Um, but the struggle in the United States is that, um, you know, there's so much movement, uh, there's so much, the communities um, don't stay in one place. Um, and so I think one, um, one question that uh, communities go through again and again in the US is, you know, when, when it comes time to um, realize that, you know, the church that's built in a particular location um, just can't, be sustained any longer and um, something else has to be repurposed. Um, well, how should it be repurposed? In, in our situation, we don't have that pressure from the government where this is a sacred place, you know, they can't just be repurposed for any other use or else. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there isn't that pressure. Uh, and so if there's any pressure at all to sort of, um, maintain the sacrality of the place, it's really got to come from the community. Um, and so, you know, we, we do live in a completely different society from late antiquity, but I hope that, you know, the struggles that we see in this book might um, help us think through our own questions today um, and maybe give us 
examples that wouldn't otherwise come to our attention because we just don't live in their society, you know, and so we don't problem solve the way they do. Um, but that's actually what I love about studying history in general. Um, we, it opens up our minds to worlds we would never conceive of on our own. Um, and I think that gives us like mental space to think about our own issues in a way we wouldn't otherwise do. Uh, but I can't say I have the answers. Um, you know, the, it, every, every um, time and place has its own circumstances and nuance and all of that really has to be honored. Great. So I, I'm gonna ask here, our, maybe our final big question. The title of your book is What Makes a Church Sacred? How would you answer that question? And, and in less than the 300 pages-ish that you already did so beautifully in your book, uh, you know, we can think kind of in terms of historical, as you mentioned, you know, these are very different times and places uh, than we now live in, but yeah, however you want to uh, tackle that one, what makes a church sacred? <laughs> Just a small question, you know, <laughs> nine minutes or less, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the way I've come to think of it as a result of doing all this work um, is to sort of to see the church as a place of encounter um, where God and God's people meet um, and forge a relationship um, and are constantly working out that relationship. Um, and what this book opened my eyes to is that um, sometimes the cost of that relationship is actually the cost of the church <laughs> itself. Um, and, you know, there were um, the bishops who, who saw that cost and knew it was that that relationship was worth more than the church itself. Um, I think there is something about that kind of radical theology that's um, really helpful. Um, you know, of course, you, you don't, you, it's a kind of a last resort measure. You don't want to lose that place of encounter. Um, but at the same time, if the forging of that relationship requires the cost of that building, um, so be it, because that it's the relationship between God um, and his people that is what it's all for. That's, that's a beautiful way to respond because I think it gets to that nuance and complexity that we see throughout the book of, you know, this is a sacred space, but then we also have the people involved in building that sacred space, making that thing sacred, but then God is also making that thing sacred, right? So that relationality, that relationship, I think is a, a beautiful way to capture um, that nuance and that dynamic. So in our last few minutes, can I ask you to share with us, uh, where's your research headed next? Um, I mean, maybe I know this book is still still pretty fresh uh, in terms of, you know, you probably feel like you maybe have just set it down and, you know, working on some other smaller things, but maybe share with us uh, what, what can we expect from you uh, coming up? So John Chrysostom and Theophilus um, pop up here and there um, quite frequently in the book. Um, and I am very much drawn to those two figures. Um, and, you know, the, the quagmire of the first originist controversy. Um, so that's, that's where my um, research interests are headed in really um, thinking about the effect that controversy had um, far beyond its own reach. Um, so I'm, I'm studying the, the life of Pacomius, who died decades before this controversy erupted, um, you know, in 399 and um, continued into the 5th century. Um, and Pacomius died in 347, um, so well before any of this yeah. began. And yet we see in the redaction of his life that... Um, that controversy had a profound effect on how his life story was told, um, and especially his foundation of the Koinonia, um, the Federation of Monasteries of Communal Monastic Living that he established in the early fourth century. Um, and so that, that's um, where my work is headed, to try and understand the redaction history of the life of Pacomius, because we have it in so many different recensions, um, and unfortunately, the original language in which it was written, Zahidic, we only have fragments. They're very precious witnesses, but they're fragments. 
Um, however, in the Arabic lives, we actually do have lives that seem to be translating Sahidic ones. You know, it's not a 100% there. They do show some, for, some redaction um, of the Sahidic, but we kind of get a window into the Sahidic lives through these Arabic translations that we do not get in the Bohiric and the Greek lives. Um, and so that's uh, where my research is taking me into those Arabic lives of Pacomius and um, trying to use them to understand the redaction history and how uh, it was affected by the first originist controversy. Absolutely. And I, I can think, you know, Pacomius is such a prominent figure. Everyone wants to claim him, you know, <laughs> no matter. So there's, there. I'm, I imagine there'd be some very surprising redactions and some maybe not so surprising uh, in ways that try and kind of align him with particular than later uh, developments in communities, right? Um, so that's, that's exciting to hear. Well, I'd like to thank everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, and uh, especially you, uh, Dr. Farag, it was a pleasure to speak with you about your work and hear about uh, both what you've worked on previously and learn from, uh, learn from you. Uh, and thank you to everyone who has joined us today. We look forward to resuming our series this fall, and we hope you will join us again then. As always, you'll be able to view a recording of this episode and our previous webinars on the Center's YouTube page. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashley.